focuses on Islam and modernity at the crossroads. Now consider those two words, Islam and modernity. How do they interact? How does a religion whose message was completed over 1400 years ago in the deserts of Arabia deal with modernity and its various issues in the world today? One such issue that is especially dear to all people, regardless of religion or race, is love. Whether it is the love between one's wife, husband, mother, father, or child, love is an, is an essence of life, a universal emotion that captivates us all. So what is Islam's stance on the different manifestations of love? To what extent does the faith promote intimacy between a husband and wife? How about the love between friends and neighbors, or within a family? What can we learn from the Holy Quran? and the life of the Muslim Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. Considering that Islam is as much a faith as it is a way of life, surely it must and is capable of answering all of these questions. It is our honor today to have Sheikh Yasser bin Jass present his respected opinions on the topic of love and Islam. Sheikh bin Jass is originally from the Holy Land of Palestine and was born in Kuwait in 1970. After completing high school in Kuwait, he moved to the United Arab Emirates to study electrical engineering. Although he returned to Kuwait to take further classes in 1990, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait forced him to move to Jordan. He then decided to go to Medina, the second holiest site in Islam, and the place of Prophet Muhammad's burial. He graduated as class valedictorian from the University of Medina's College of Sharia, Islamic Jurisprudence, in 1996. In 1997, he went to war-torn Bosnia to work as a youth counselor and relief program aide to assist in the rebuilding of the nation. And in 2000, he immigrated to the United States, where he is currently an imam, or spiritual leader, at the Islamic Center in El Paso, Texas. Chef Bib Jass is also an instructor at the al Mahdab Institute, an organization that provides seminars leading his students to a bachelor's degree in Islamic studies. His recent courses of instruction at the Institute include the Code of All, the Evolution of Philip, which focuses on the historical development of Islamic law. This uh, love notes, the spirit of marriage in Islam, which deals with the concept of love, etiquettes, and engage, etiquettes of engagement, marriage, and family life, and also focuses on the means of developing a deeper, more fulfilling, and loving relationship with one's spouse. And the Code of Scholars, the theory of Islamic law and jurisprudence. Sheikh Yasser Bujas is married with three beautiful children, Omar, eight, Ibrahim, six, and Bushman, four. This event would not have been possible without the help of our co-sponsors. So we'd like to thank the Islamic Students at Stanford University, the Muslim Student Awareness Network, the Abbasi Program in Islamic Studies, the Bechtel International Center, the Associated Students at Stanford University, and the Office of Religious Life. Without further ado, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Sheikh Yasser Kujas. Islam has to do with love. 
How can you explain to the people that love is indeed a very important aspect of this people? Well, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was sent, was sent with the Quran, Allah had said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent you, O Muhammad, but as a mercy for mankind. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent as a mercy for mankind. What does that mean? Is everything that we as human beings would require and need to live our life should be provided by the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we will see in this lecture a beautiful experience, a beautiful example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, specifically in a topic that it's rarely and scarcely to hear about in masajid and religious preaching, and that is love. I'll give you my own experience. Growing up in a Muslim environment and kind of very conservative community, I would say, was kind of hard really to express your love. You cannot really suppress those feelings. Why? Because they're flowing from inside, outside. It's out of your control sometimes. So how can you do that? You see, so speaking about this topic in a Muslim community would be very hard and difficult. I mean, the last person you would like to talk to in those kind of environments would be your father or your mom. So growing in this kind of culture, you even come to learn that talking about love is something shameful. Oh my God, you cannot say that unless you're married. Once you get married, Fine, you're welcome, you can express those feelings. Also, you would go sometimes to search uh, in the Islamic library or bookstore, and you go through the books of Fuqh and Sharia, and in the middle there are some titles, like Tawq al-Hamama, the ring of the dark, by Ibn Hazm Allah Ta'ala, Radat al-Muhibbin, the garden of the lovers, by a great scholar like Ibn Qayyim al Jazeera, Allah Ta'ala. Those kind of beautiful titles. But once you read them, you say, Oh my God, what those books are doing over here? So they become like taboo because you get that culture, you get that sense, feel of guilt. You know, you are not yet ready to read those books. Once you get married, you read them. But subhanAllah, this book will come when you get a chance to read this. And I did when I was a student in Medina. It was really amazing. Uh, that when you read those beautiful words from scholars, ulama, that we all know about them being great fuqaha, that their specialty is only in jurisprudence, in law, in sharia, in theology, but when they talk about love, you even don't even think that those people, they know anything about sharia. Because in our mind, love, talking about love, talking about law and Islamic law and system is a completely different story. Here in America, as a result of this, you will see that because most people who come from, uh, I'm talking about Muslim community here specifically, they come from an uh, 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 immigrant background, it is their parents, and therefore they fall into this cultural gap. Their parents have their own culture regarding these issues, and those kids are now developing their own culture about it. And that's when the start will start taking place. Parents are trying to impose their own definition of love on their kids. And those kids are now trying to force their parents to change to the new culture. And what happens? Tension that cannot be solved easily. Love is natural. It's a human passion. And it's a universal language. It has nothing to do with deen, faith, religion, in a sense that, that all people from all backgrounds, all ethnicities, all languages, all colors, all faith and religions, will experience this human and universal language that is love. Every single human being would like to be loved by someone, I would like to experience that love towards someone else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not suppress those feelings. Allah azza allowed us to express those, but definitely in the lawful manner and the best etiquette. And that's the etiquette of Muhammad in this lecture, inshallah, I'll be talking to you about the spirit of love, or the spirit of marriage in Islam, and that is love and mercy. It's not going to be about marriage, it's not going to be about matrimonial services, it's about love in Islam. What do we know about it? Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the leading experts in this field amongst Muslim scholars, uh, who died uh, in the uh, 11th uh, century, in al andalus in his book Tawbul Hamama, he defines love of being of two parts. 
He says, just think about love and the earnestness of love. Means joking about love and then the seriousness of love. Most people, they think of love within the first pattern. Meaning, just as a joke, an endeavor, an adventure, and a time for just for spending some time in pleasure and enjoying your time with someone else and so forth. But once it becomes serious, then they forget about love. Which means, when, uh, when you say seriousness and the earnestness of love, here the fulfillment of love through marriage. And that's what most people they say, unfortunately, marriage kills love. So the devil of the theory, you better not get married. If you won't like to experience love in, in your life, you better not uh, get married. Just stay, in, you know, as long as you can, stay a bachelor as long as you can. Once you think that you, you, know, you run out of emotions, only then you can get married. And you will see from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's totally the opposite. Here an example. One time Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and his wife, his young wife, she heard the Prophet sallallahu mentioning Khadija, who died years before he even married her. So, she got very upset, kind of jealous. Aisha was a very jealous woman. So she spoke against Khadija. She said, Ya Rasulullah, what do you need with Khadija right now? She's already dead and she's already buried and she's become, you know, dust. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you with a young maiden like herself. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got very upset. He said, don't say that about Khadija. فَإِنِّي وُزِبْتُ حُبَّهَا For I was blessed for with her love. Another, another translation, I was really, I was blessed with love for her. Either way, the Prophet ﷺ loved Khadija so much that he was so loyal, so faithful to her, even after her death. Even Aisha, who was the most beloved amongst the Prophet ﷺ to him, he could not let her speak anything against Khadija, even though she was already dead. Let's see what's the definition of love. When people talk about love, there are two major definitions of love. Number one, love has passions and emotions that you express for someone else. And number two, the sexual desire. That's all. So when people think about love, some think of it as an emotion, passion, experience, and some they think of it as a lust and desire. Men and women think of it differently. However, those are the most important two definitions of love. If you open any books, any dictionaries, that's what you get from those definitions. In the Arabic language itself, it has a so unique definition for love. Let's go through this. Who knows what is the Arabic word for love? What is it? al hub Hub. In the Arabic language, love, the word love is hub. How many letters do we have here? You know, how many, how many letters do we have in the word Al-Hub? Two. Two. Ibn Qayyim al in his book, Madar al Salikin, he made an analysis, basically like anatomy of love from the word love itself, Hub, in the Arabic language. He says, number one, the word Hub in the Arabic language, love, two letters. He says, this is a symbol to remind people that his love is always between two people. Between a man and a woman. Then he goes further, saying, the structure of the Arabic language is, that is so unique. You know, if you study the, the articulation points of Arabic alphabets and the characteristics of Arabic alphabets, and this is part of the science of Tajweed, for those who would like to really learn the beauty of the Arabic language, learn the Tajweed, how to recite the Quran perfectly. Some of those qualities and characteristics of Arabic alphabets are so unique that cannot be found probably in other languages. An example for this. Anything in the Arabic language, probably, those letters, they have quality, they have characteristics that if you, if you uh, uh, form a word out of those letters, the word itself should carry a meaning that is related to this uh, quality or characteristic of that alphabet. For example, letter she in the Arabic language. If you open the book of Tajweed, one of the main characteristics of she in the Arabic language is she, is an intishar, dispersion, spreading out. Any Arabic word that has letter sheen in it should carry sense of dispersion or intishar, spreading out. As an example, shams, 
the sun, what does it do? It spreads what? Light, warmth, life, you name it. How about a shaitan? Shaitan, what does he spread? Good? At least the devil spreads evil, shua, ray, and so on. And there are other examples in the Arabic language. When you use alphabets, they give those certain meanings. Now let's see the word hub itself. Ha and ba. We have ha and ba. Letter ha, which is not a part of an English language, ha comes from the throat. It is, as a matter of fact, it's the deepest Arabic alphabet. One of the deepest Arabic alphabets comes deep from the throat. That's a symbol according to the Hakim Al-Qaim Rahimahullah Ta'ala that love comes from inside, outside. Because it comes from the throat. Plus, when you say it's coming from the throat, it's a symbol of what? Sometimes because it's, it, it's just like love, it chokes you. When you think about your beloved, your love, how do you feel? Especially at time of distress, you feel choked with love. People, they start cheating, start crying, but they feel it in their throat, they can't even talk sometimes, and that's why it's coming from the throat. Plus, it comes with the dhamma, and the dhamma is a sound, the power in the Arabic language, that is also so profound, so strong. Hope, to show that love is a genuine and a very strong emotion. How about letter ba? The alphabet ba. It comes from the lips. And when you say hope, I mean, how do you pronounce it? Hope. Even the shape of the shape of the letter ba comes in one the manifestation of love. And that is the kiss. So it starts from inside, outside, with a symbol of love. That's why they call it in the Arabic language hope. As for the meaning, just go and check the dictionary. You will be amazed. The word hope itself, it comes to meaning like uh, like uh, being clear bright, genuine, and so on. It is all not necessarily related to the word hub itself, love, but anything that has those two letters, ha and ba, would give those meanings of purity, of highness and clear emergence, stability, a sense, and so forth. All these words are the meaning of love. How about the nature of love? The nature of love, many Muslim scholars, they uh, wrote in uh, their books about the different interpretation of love from different, of course, perspectives. Uh, even uh, they included some of those philosophical studies that were uh, they, they, they brought from uh, other cultural and civilizations. So some they explain love as being uh, a physical, uh, uh, from its physical aspect. Some they, they discuss love from its philosophical aspect, psychological, spiritual, and they have developed many, many theories that even some of the contemporary theories that we use in the English language have been taken from some of those original Arabic and Islamic works about love. One of those unique theories, the theory of Imam bin Hazm rahimahullah ta'ala, who believes that love is about the one, as they call it in this culture nowadays. Why? Because he believes that love starts in heaven. So it's about scattered souls who meet in the upper universe, and if they meet in the upper universe and they get the same opportunity to meet on earth, they will get that harmony and they love the love that they dream about. And if they meet in heaven, but they don't meet on earth, they won't get that love that they desire or maybe uh, long for. That's his theory. Muslim scholars are against it. They say, no, this is not, uh, this is not what love is all about. And they give their own theory of love, saying that love is about similarity, it's about resemblance, and to make it sure, they say it's about compatibility. People, when they go and they meet a potential spouse, what are they looking for? They look for a common ground that they both share. So they start asking each other about things that they might think could be basically the beginning of a loving relationship. So if the guy, for example, he loves football, he will go and ask his wife, or maybe potentially in response. He says, so, uh, do you like to watch sports? And if she says, no, I don't like this stuff. I like to watch this or that show, he gets disappointed. And vice versa. If she likes something else, and she starts, you know, saying, do you like these kind of things? And he's not that type of person. 
So they get disappointed. So they try to find as, you know, as, as much possible characteristics, qualities, uh, maybe ideas, opinions that they share together. And most of the Muslim scholars, they think that love is about compatibility. Why? We will come to this inshallah. Because I know most people think, no, it's not about that. Because once you're in love, you're in love. And therefore, you know, everything is going to fall in place. You become perfect relationship. Because you love this person the way they are. True, but this is called in love, not love. Because you're being in love, so you think that this person is completely perfect. How about falling in love in the first sight? Somebody just said, okay, but you know, people usually they look like a beautiful image. So they want to see someone who's beautiful. She should be beautiful, she should be in this universe. She must be handsome, Prince uh, uh, Charm, Prince this, Prince that, and so on. So what's the point? What's the relationship or the connection between love and images? It's specifically beauty. Ibn Hazm rahimahullah ta'ala answer for that as well. He said, number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in that perfect model or mold. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, that we have created uh, the son of Adam is Adam, man, he acts in the queen in the first mode, and that's the perfect mode, creation. So, therefore, his theory is, is that because we are perfect, we also like to see something as compatible, perfection. So, we always look and we always see that perfection would exist in beauty and beautiful images. And it's even our uh, use of the language. So when you see something that looks perfect for you, what do you usually say about it? It is so beautiful. You see a building, it's a structure. Instead of saying perfect, you say, oh, it's so beautiful. A car, it's so beautiful. A child so beautiful, an article so beautiful. You say beautiful equals perfect. So we make beauty and love almost, you know, equal. Why? Because we think that beauty is an example of perfection, and that's what we look for perfection. Uh, in addition to that, the culture itself told us that love is about beauty. How many of you enjoy reading uh, uh, fairy tales? Come on, you enjoy reading fairy tales? Don't be shy. <laughs> I enjoy it. I, I still read them. Uh, and when you read fairy tales like for example Cinderella, Snow White, uh, you name it, there are many, many fairy tales out there in the market. What do they talk about? What's the objective of the whole story? She saw him, he saw her, they fell in love because he's handsome and she's beautiful, and that's it. And then at the end of the story, what do they say? And they live happily ever after. Why? Because they're in love. And even sometimes you read stories that are really ridiculous, in the mind of course of a mature or an adult. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, but it's a fairy tale. That's why you told read that, and you enjoy it, and you love it, and you read it, and even you read it for your kids. Why? Because it's, it's, it's beautiful. It is so nice, so amusing. So you don't really take it seriously. But that's the culture. One of those stories, I even forgot actually the name of the story, probably Dorani, I think something like that. Uh, a young girl who was created by a wish of some family, who didn't have children, and she was taken from the family, and she ended up in a nest of uh, some of those birds who lived in the forest for, for many years. She disappeared, from, of course, from the human world. And when she became uh, probably about 15, maybe 17 years old, a prince who was going on a hunting uh, uh, trip with his uh, people, he sees her up there in that nest and he sees her beautiful face, so he falls in love with her and that was it. He could not eat, he could not sleep, he could not do anything, so his father, he, he, he goes and he puts an army to go and look for her and they trick her to bring her down from that nest and he married her and they lived happily ever after. Do you know what believe in this? That's all in there. Because we believe Beauty is a sign of perfection, and that's why we tolerate these kind of examples. Because I know, I mean, if she lived 17 years in a nest, how would she look like? <laughs> what kind of life is going to be talking? How is she going to communicate with him? But still, we enjoy it, and we love it because it's so beautiful. 
That's the concept. It's so beautiful, so you love it, and you enjoy that. So it's part of the culture that, yes, beauty is equal to perfection. And for us, it is equivalent to love. But in reality, it is not. If this is love, what's the ruling of it in Islam? Is it halal? Is it haram? Is it wajib? Is it prohibited? Is it mandatory? Is it permissible? Is it discouraged? What is the ruling of love? And Ibn Hazm ta'ala, and most of our Muslim scholars also, they gave the identical answer, saying that love is not a disapproved by religion, nor prohibited by the law, or every part is in Allah's hand, in God's hand. You cannot say about love that it's haram or halal, that it's prohibited or that it's mandatory. You cannot say that. Because when it hits, it hits hard. It's not in your hand, but you are going to be held accountable for the actions you take after you experience this love. Ibn Ibn Qayyim al Jazeera in his book, Al Jawab al Kafi, that's sufficient answer. He says that as for the love of women, he is to love women, men to love women. He said, it's not a blame morphy thing. It's a sign of the human perfection. So in Islam, we consider this as a sign of human perfection. It's not a sin to feel that you love someone. It's not a sin that you really experience love, but it's what you do about it, the thing that you are going to be held accountable for. If this is the case, so does love happen by choice or by force? How many of you say that is by choice? Let me see your hands. The show of hands. How many of you say that is by choice? By force? <laughs> Any third opinion? Okay, so does it happen by force or by choice? Some people they think it happens by force. It means, you know, I really don't know. I just fell in love with her. I just, I just, you know, feel something for him in my heart. So I don't know how it comes, but it just happened. I woke up. And that's it, I'm in love. Some people say, no, you have something to do about it. Means you choose to open your heart for this individual. You choose to look at her or at him. You choose to talk to this person. You choose to allow this person to creep into your heart. And that's why you're in love with this person. Ibn Qayyim al-Jazeera, rahimahullah ta'ala, he answered it as well. Saying that the primary stages of love happen by choice. Means you have, you are, you are the one who opens his heart or her heart to someone else. No one can really force you to open your heart to them. Unless of course, as I said, you, know, you just tolerate that. So in that natural human interaction between men and women, those kind of relationships would develop those kind of softness towards one another. And that's why in Islam there were some limits and some also regulations in order to guide people not to fall in something or not to practice anything haram because of those feelings. No. Feelings are okay. Acceptable, they are completely permissible because it's not in your hand. It's not in your hand, it's in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Ibn Qayyim then he says, once the person falls in love and that love scattered their heart, if they do something wrong or something that is foolish in the British of some people afterwards, May Allah subhanahu wa forgive them, it is not gonna, they are not going to be held accountable for that primary. However, we are all asked to be aware of our actions. So before we fall into the trap of committing something wrong, we have to make sure that we always abide by the laws of the Sharia. To what limit can we experience that? What can we get the evidence for these in our Islamic law? The source of Sharia, the source of law, number one is the Qur'an, and number two is the Sunnah, the traditional prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Do we have anything in the Qur'an that speaks about love? Any evidences? For many people they think the Qur'an is just about, you know, halal haram. Halal haram, that's all. It's permissible, prohibited, and that's it. It doesn't really talk about these kind of demon subjects. No. In the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made love as one of his favors and one of his bounties on mankind. Saying, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ قَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ 
And among his signs is this, that he created for you males from amongst yourselves, that you may do in tranquility with them. And he has put love and mercy. And he has put love and mercy between your hearts. Verily, that are signs for those who are dead. See, this ayah starts with, and amongst his signs. This verse is in chapter Arum, Surah Arum. In that chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the favors and the bounties He bestowed upon on human beings and mankind. It's the creation of, of earth, the creation of the heavens, the creation of this and that and so on. Among those beautiful bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creation of love. Mankind, and He gave us those two beautiful qualities. Love and mercy. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, Muslim scholar and Mufassir, in his tafsir, the commentary of the Qur'an, he derived from this time the two main components of a successful marriage. He says, marriage is just like a bird that flies with two wings. One is called love, and the other one is called mercy. If you want to fly high, you have to have love and mercy in a relationship. But, if one wing becomes weaker, what happens? You start falling down. So you always have to practice that you keep flying higher and higher as much as possible by balancing between love and mercy. You see, in most relationships, people, uh, they think that marriage is all about love. Which means, if we stop loving each other, that relationship doesn't exist anymore. So why are we married? And therefore they say, I really don't love her, or that he, she doesn't love him anymore. Which means they are justifying their separation. Saying it's over, that's it. You can't really stay together. They don't know that the other part of it is mercy. And you see, most families, for those married who last, you know, longer, they run on mercy more than running on love. So if you ask her after 15 years, she, you tell her, you say, why are you staying with this guy if you don't love him? So you know, I really feel sorry for him. <laughs> <laughs> because if I leave him, I think he's going to die. <laughs> he's clumsy, he doesn't know what to do. He, he, that's it. He, he can't, you know, like, survive in this life. On the other hand, you see also the man. You ask her, if you don't love him, why do you stay with her? So who's going to take care of the kids? It's not just about me and her. We have three kids, 10 kids, 20. So what are we going to do with those kids? So this, that, that marriage keeps running on mercy more than love. But what they forget about, that when I say mercy, it doesn't mean that love, it, it, mercy is not love by itself. Because actually, love in marriage transforms to different stages. So once we're still young, we were bachelors before we get married, now we're married. We only have me and you, and that's it. No one else in our life. So that's the ultimate you know, concept of love for men and women. Just that the togetherness experience. Me and you, that's it. No one else. I don't want you to see your mom in my house. I don't want you to keep you telling me that's going about your mom in my parents' house. No, it's me and you right now. Let's stay together for some time. Then once they have the first child, and she starts dividing her heart between you know, that little baby and that big baby. <laughs> so. It's difficult, it's difficult for them right now to think that, you know, they can survive with that. Most men, they don't like the idea that, you know, someone else has taken a part of their wife's life. But on the other hand as well, women, they don't really think that men are the only ones to blame in that relationship. You know, I'm doing the sacrifice, I'm taking care of the kids and so on, and think that the man has also to, uh, to accept the situation as is. In general, what I'm saying is that men and women they forget that love transforms itself to our this relationship. It means when we were in love, it was just about me and you. Now the love is for the family, for the new baby born. And then when we grow up in this relationship, we have a bigger family, we have new hopes, new, of course, you know, uh, dreams that we start building. It's all based on love and it's also based on mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many ayat in the, word, in the Quran spoke about love and the concept of love as, uh, as well. How about the tradition of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam speak about that, or was it something shameful, shameful that we cannot talk about? 
No, we have to talk about it because the Prophet himself didn't feel shy when he was asked about his love. Amr ibn As the companion of Rasulullah one time uh, he asked the Prophet in public, said, Ya Rasulullah, man ahadu who is the most beloved to you? The reason he asked the question is because he thought the answer would be himself. Because when the Prophet وسلم, uh, received him, he embraced Islam kind of late, about the seventh Hijri year, and he did it to the Prophet وسلم, even though Amr ibn As, he fought against the, the Prophet uh, for many years, and now he's, he's coming back as Muslim. Immediately the Prophet, he acknowledged his, his quality, his skills as a general. So he assigned him as the head of one of those military traditions. On the way back, Amr ibn As was so proud of it. He had one of those deletes with him as well. Those universal Islam he made earlier. And the Prophet didn't say, no, no, because universal Islam late, so someone else has to leave. But he acknowledged his skills. So he came and he asked him in front of the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, man ahab, man ahab Who is the most beloved to you? And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the most, he was actually a sadiq al masdur the trustworthy and the truthful man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For me and you right now, we assume when, when Amr Mas asked the Prophet about this question, he meant amongst men, of course. He, didn't talk, he wasn't talking about his family. So the Prophet immediately he answered with no hesitation. He said, Aisha. Immediately, with her name, he said, Aisha. But he, he was surprised. Amr Mas said, No, 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 I'm talking about men. Men. The Prophet says, Abuha, her father. Still, he's saying, her father. Then he asked, who is next, who is next, few names, and then he stopped. <laughs> and Hanif said, Bukhara. Also, the Prophet وسلم, one time received his daughter Fatima, when he was already in bed with his wife Aisha. Fatima was the envoy of the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu is complaining about, you know, Aisha. Saying, Ya Rasulullah, the other wives are complaining that everybody is waiting for her day so they can give their, give their presents and gifts to you uh, when she's in her house. But once you move to another house, they stop you from giving those gifts, they keep waiting and so on. So they kind of get upset. So they want the Prophet to say something about it. The Prophet sallallahu was there listening to Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and his beloved daughter. And Aisha, she said, was well, the story she said, and I was just sitting there listening. Why? Because that's her husband, that's in-law issue, so I don't want to interfere. And she was just listening. Then the Prophet وسلم, answered Fatima just to basically to, to close the subject. He said, Qala ala Don't you love what I love? She said, Yes, Sayyid Rasulullah. The Prophet then pointed to Aisha and said, Then love her. What does that mean? It means I love her, I don't want you to talk about her. Just leave me and I'm Aisha. Don't let anybody talk to you, put you in that position anymore. And the Prophet وسلم, answered her with those beautiful words showing how much he loved his wife Aisha. Saying on the authority of Aisha, Aisha told me such and such. He didn't mention her, he didn't mention her by name. He used to say, Haddatatni Habibat Rasulullah. Means I heard this from the love of Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah. Talking about Aisha And here's another story. The Prophet even he just he wasn't just satisfied, you know, expressing his love naturally like this. He even he accepted and acknowledged that this happens in you know among human being naturally. As an example for this, the story of Mughid and Barira. Mughid was the man and Barira was his wife. They were married under the slavery system, when they had a slavery system back then. When she became free, Aisha, she bought and she freed Barira immediately. When she became free, she had the choice and the option of staying with her husband or just leave that marriage. She used to walk out from there. And she chose to be free. So she left her husband. And now Mughi, her husband, for the first time he discovered that, oh my God, my wife is leaving me. He couldn't take it. So he goes after his wife. Ya Barira, please, please, what's wrong? Let's come back again together. And she was resisting him. He starts crying and going after her, pleading and you know, begging her. No positive response from her, completely neglecting that. 
he goes to seek intercession. He goes to speak on his behalf. So he goes to some of the dignitaries of, of Medina, of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He didn't walk. She was so stubborn. Then at the end, he goes to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I mean, you assume the Prophet, the Messenger of God. I mean, what would he do to him? Should he give him, you know, a chance, or maybe talk on his behalf? I mean, what he would waste his time for for something like this? Subject that might not be serious to so many people. But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took the initiative. And he said, okay, can you imagine the feelings of Mughir when the Prophet accepted to intercede for him? He was so excited that the Prophet now is going to speak on his behalf to very long, which means what? He's assuming that Bera would say, yes, Samiyah okay, I accept it. The Prophet goes to Bera and he said, yeah, Bera why don't you get back to Mughir? She said, Amrun ya Rasulullah and Shafi, are you commanding me? or interceding for him. He said, no, I'm just interceding. I'm not imposing this on him. She said, in Kanakana, if this is the case, فَلَا حَالِكَ لِبِهِ If this is the case, then I, I, don't, I, I don't need him. That's it. And the Prophet went back to Mughid with the news. What do you expect Mughid to do? He broke down completely, in tears, crying. Even a hadith was mentioned that he kept going after her in Medina for days and nights and walking weeping and crying in the streets of Medina. At the one time, on occasion, the Prophet ﷺ was standing with his uncle Abbas and he saw Mughid doing that in the streets. Then he goes to his uncle saying, Ya Abbas, isn't it so amazing how Mughid loves Barira, means so much, and how Barira hates Mughid? Means telling us that love is a mysterious thing. One time the Prophet ﷺ was asked a question by a man who was a guardian of an, an, uh, a female orphan. Uh, he asked the Prophet about proposal. That young lady, she received a proposal from two people. One was rich and the other was, was a poor man. Now if you were in this position, what would you choose? The rich or the poor? The rich. You should do what you to do to the rich because she was orphan. She didn't get an opportunity in this life. So I want to take her in her to a higher status. Give her an opportunity in this life. But she had affection and feeling towards the poor, for the poor. And so the man came to the Prophet saying, Ya Rasulullah, we really have inclination for the rich one, but she feels something to, for, the, for the poor one. So what should we do? The Prophet says, That we don't, we don't see anything better for, the two, for, for those who are in love, but marriage. Means if they love each other, then let them get married. It doesn't matter, rich, poor, whatever, if they are in love and seriously they are in love, then you better help them and facilitate that for them. That doesn't mean, of course, that we don't uh, consider other factors in our relationships. No, because some people, they just, once they are, in what we call it, the in-love experience, and that's when they see that the person that they love is the perfect match. They become completely blind from anything else. So when you try to talk to them, they'll say, no, 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 he is different. Or when you talk to her, or when you talk to them, you may say, no, she's, she's totally a different person. No, it's not like an experience, you know. No, it's not going to happen. Why? Because we love each other? Because we are in love? No, because we love each other. They always do that word again and again and again and again. And we know how that this love or in love experience can be really elusive. Because you see that in real life, people who have been dating for months, years, weeks, whatever, and then once they get married, once they get married, love stops there. Immediately. That's when they realize that love or marriage is not, you know, uh, a joke. It's a serious matter. Even love is a serious matter. It's become a really serious matter. Now you know the reality of this person. How much this person is willing to sacrifice, how much this person is ready to compromise, how much this person is ready to do such and such for you, and so forth. Before that, they are willing to do whatever you want. Why? Because they're in love. So, therefore, I'm saying that, yes, we say that it is okay to facilitate that for them, but other factors need to be considered, and that's why the standard system of getting married is so unique, that people need to be together, and have also a third party try to monitor that conversation. Help them instead of keep going to the emotional path, then back again and try to bring them to that channel. Muslim scholars, 
they wrote about love in many, many works. Uh, one of those uh, unique uh, studies, I unfortunately is not available in English language. And I'm still looking at to uh, find an Arabic copy of this book, which was authored by Muhammad ibn Dawood in uh, the, ninth, the, uh, the ninth century. It's called Az Zuhra bi Akbari Ghani Adam. Az Zuhra, uh, uh, bringing the tales, I'm talking about the tales and the stories of Ben Adam. And that book, that book specifically, is a, an early anthropological study of uh, human aspects called love. The scholar in this book, he studied one Arab tribe called Banu Udama and just studied from that tribe one quality, love, how they experienced love, because they were very famous for love. Even in the Arabic culture, when we, say, when we talk about love, we say al hub al udri The novel love is equal to al hub al udri after this tribe. So he is basically saying that uh, uh, he studied this, this tribe and he came out with a conclusion of 100 different qualities of love according to the practice of Banu Adam. It's a very unique study by Muhammad ibn Dawood al uh, There's another book also which is Ibn Hazm's book, Tawb uh, al-Hamama, the name of the dog. It's available in English. If you type his name even on, uh, just Google his name, you will find that uh, book available online for free if you want to uh, read the book. It's a very unique study also of book, of, of love. Uh, another book which is an encyclopedia by Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah It's a compilation of uh, previous works and also his own work and uh, interpretation of love by Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah The Garden of the Lovers. Part of this book has been translated to English language. It's available also on the internet for those who would like to read uh, from the work of Ibn Qayyim. He died in the 14th uh, century, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Now, I would like to conclude, inshaAllah ta'ala, with some examples from the earnestness of love. When we say the earnestness of love, we talk about family life in Islam. And family life in Islam has a very uh, unique uh, structure. We believe as Muslims that family is uh, uh, a divinely inspired institution. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah just spoke about marriage in the first place, say, Mithaqan ghaliro. God Allah subhanahu wa called marriage in the Quran mitatan ghalila, which means a strong covenant. Being the strong covenant, who made it so strong? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore you see in the Quran, the regulation and rules of marriage and divorce and family life are mentioned in details in the Quran and the tradition of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Because it's not about me and you only, it's about us all. Me and you, as a husband and wife, then we have children, we have parents, grandparents, uncles. The whole society is established on individuals like us when they get married. Also in Islam, marriage is a social contact. When we say contact, it's based on uh, uh, rules of, of, of uh, rights and obligations. Rights and obligations is one of the most, the most difficult or maybe um, sensitive issue between husband and wife. Because most of the struggles, let's say number one, uh, number one reason for people to, uh, 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 to fight, couples to fight, and uh, uh, to create marital discord, number one reason is affairs, number two, arguments. And if you go deep in the essence of those arguments, it's about rights and obligations. It means what is right for me, and what is your obligation. So you find them fighting about, you know, it's my rights, it's not your business, it's your obligation, it's your responsibility, husband and wife, they discuss the issues without knowing what it should be, their rights and their obligations. Islam has provided a clear image of rights and obligations in the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah not, not to get into the, the subject of rights and, and responsibilities here, but just to let you know that it has been organized in the Quran and Sunnah. What people practice in their homes or their countries, probably Maybe 80% of what they do has nothing to do with the rights and obligations in Islam between husband and wife. I also do a lot of marriage counseling. And people they come to me and they we discuss these matters. They think they think that they have the right doing things and it is responsible for the other party. And they have no idea that they have been missing up you know, on the rights and obligations from Islamic perspective. Rasulullah he experienced he exercised this love with his wife 
and he was very honest with it and very sincere sallallahu alayhi wa because he knew that love is something that you do you practice not, not just a lip service and I'll just give you some of those examples that one time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to help uh, he was with his wife Safiya radiallahu alayhi wa they were traveling in that, that caravan and then he wanted to assist her to mount the camel and right now in this particular life we don't have camels Probably in some countries they do. Uh, but he wants to assist his wife to ride the camel. Just like now he's open the door. You open the door to let your wife in. I know this is the first few probably months and weeks of marriage they will do that and then that's it. Uh, they have the remote control, they can just open the door to the house, even from the window. But Rasulullah when he wanted to help and assist his wife Sophia, he kneeled all the way down himself. And uh, he made his thigh and his knee as a step for his wife, Sophia, to step on his foot, on his, on his thigh, and jump on the camel. And on the way while she's going up, he was also screaming her and covering her. You know, of course, when she raises her foot, that she doesn't reveal the other leg of the Allah Ta'ala wa Ta'ala. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he also uh, he was very patient with his wives. He was a good listener. Very good listener. Most women they complain that men they don't listen to them. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one time heard from Aisha a long, long uh, uh, story. It's called Hadith Umm Zara. If you, read, if you just read the story by itself, it would take about five, seven minutes maybe, just reading it. Uh, if you know that, that, of course, the language. But in the Arabic, that was kind of difficult a little bit, so it might take longer. However, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet, he kept listening to her until she finished without interrupting. He didn't say, so what's the point? No, he actually he kept listening to her once when she, when she finished the story, he gave feedback, positive feedback, saying, I will be for you like Abu Zahra was for Umi The best among you in the story, he gave her the best, or the, the conclusion of the story is that I would like to be the, the best example of what you mentioned in that story. Rasulullah even when he used to call his wife Aisha, he used to call her with a beautiful name like nicknames. You know sometimes, uh, you don't call your wife with a name, so you use, you use like honey, stuff like that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to call her Aish, which is in the Arabic language, is a sign like saying, for example, for Bushra, it's like my little daughter, we call her Shushu. So you call her Shushu, don't call her Bushra. Even people don't know her name. Why? Because you always call her Shushu, Shushu, and so forth. Aish, the Prophet used to call her sometimes Aish, and this is a sign of love as well. The Prophet even used to, uh, uh, to feed his wife. You know when they sit together in a very intimate relationship and a uh, nice meal together they eat, he would help her, she would, would eat together and he would be playful with that as well. At one occasion, as Aisha al narrated, the Prophet وسلم, presented a cup for her and she drank from that cup, she, he took it back again and he switched that cup. He switched that cup towards him and then he just knows of course the, the taste of her lips and he put his lips on that same spot, drinking from that same spot. Why is that? As a sign of love. And Aisha, she said that even the Prophet وسلم, when he used to uh, leave the house, he would give her what we call it, goodbye kiss. He would kiss her and leave to the middle. Now don't tell me that this is a lustful kiss. Why? Because he was fasting. He would be fasting sometimes, he said. He used to kiss his wife while he's fasting and he would go to the masjid. That's a, a kiss of respect, mercy, and love. The stories about the Prophet are amazing. And there are some even stories people that don't imagine that the Prophet would do that with his wife, وسلم, like the wife of Rasulullah, creating what we call it nowadays practical jokes on him. They would do practical jokes on him. And he would tolerate that. And he would just you know, be happy. He would laugh with them. Why? Because he was so tolerant, so loving, so loving, and so understanding. That's just some of the examples from Rasulullah. And even the ulama, Muslim scholars, real and genuine Muslim scholars, they follow the steps of Muhammad in that as an example for this, to the final story. The story of Imam Abu Bakr al-Kasani rahimahullah ta'ala is one of the leaders of Madhab Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah the school of thought of uh, uh, Islamic jurisprudence Abu Hanifa school of thought 
um, he was a student of uh, Al Imam Al I mean Al Imam uh, Al Samarqandi. What he did, he wrote a commentary on a book that his teacher authored. And when he finished, his teacher, he, he actually, he, he was so admired by the effort his student did in that huge encyclopedia for a small book that his teacher authored himself, that he offered his daughter in marriage. And he accepted this book to be the dowry. And the friend of Kassani, he accepted the offer as well. And he married the daughter of his teacher, Fatima. In his biography, they say, وَكَانَ شَدِيدَ الْحُبِّ لَهَا That he loved her so much that when she died and he buried her, he kept visiting her every Thursday night. He would go and visit her. Until he died, and then he was buried next to her. Out of love, that he remained, he remained so faithful to his wife, رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى In conclusion, as you see, love, as our ulama, they say, will remain one of the mysteries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His creation. To say or claim that we have a clear definition of what love is all about, it is almost impossible, but we can make our own effort to explain that the way we think. However, just like what you probably heard, uh, Muslim scholars, they also contribute to the theory of Islam, meaning it has nothing to do or does not contradict with the rulings of Islam or the rulings of the Sharia, as long as we always observe and we keep the feeling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala between our eyes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will throw anything else. Allah wa sallallahu wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. So once again, we'd like to thank Sheikh Yasser bin Jass for taking the time to inform us on love and Islam. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of you for coming out and joining us today. And before I let you all out, I'd like to mention that Sheikh bin Jass will be instructing a course for Code of the Scholars at San Jose State University uh, from March 9th to 11th and March 16th to 18th. So please feel free to join us at the booth here to my right for further information. Thank you and good Just a bit more information, sorry. Uh, Chef has just said that uh, he'd like to pray about it, so if anyone would like to join him, please feel free. And afterwards, he'll be having a question and answer session. Thank you.